biar lo ayo. Welcome to the very first of Impact 2020, a series on LGBTQI plus persons' experiences of sexual health and reproductive rights. All people, including those living in humanitarian settings, have the right to sexual and reproductive health. To exercise this right, affected populations must have an enabling environment and access to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health information and services so they can make free and informed choices. This, of course, includes intersex persons. However, there is very little done in terms of research or, or projects uh, that directly involve people uh, with uh, diverse sex characteristics. And so we're going to be talking a little bit more broadly today around um, sexual and reproductive health and rights for intersex people. Uh, next slide, please, Adi. I'm really excited and pleased to introduce some guest panelists with us today. Uh, we have Julius, who's a prominent Ugandan activist and uh, the director um, of Support Initiative for People with Atypical Sex Development. Uh, Julius has been awarded several prominent human rights awards. We have Essan, who is the executive director and founding member of Campaign for Change. He is the co-founder and current board member of Intersex Asia. We have Ileana, a pharmacist, chemist, harm reduction educator, refugee activist, and trustee at Intersex Awareness New Zealand. And Morgan Carpenter, a bioethicist and the co-executive director of Intersex Human Rights Australia, the creator of the Intersex Flag and founder of the Intersex Day Project. Next slide, please. Um, and I am Lana Wolf. Um, I'm the co-founding director um, of Edge Effect, and I am the LGBTQI plus subworking group chair for um, IWAG. Next slide, please. Um, IWAG, or the Interagency Working Group on Reproductive Health in Crises, is an international coalition of organisations and individuals working collectively to advance the sexual and reproductive health and rights in humanitarian settings. So without much ado, I will um, ask some questions. And the first question I would like to ask the panel, um, a very simple question, but is it really? Um, who is an intersex individual? Um, and maybe I can um, just ask you, whoever would like to share, just to answer that question. I think, I think we all have to answer this question multiple times during the day for it days and days and years, but I think we all might have a definition that is very similar. And I think I would like Morgan to define us because Morgan knows how to do it very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, um, you know, I mean, like every concept, like the concept of women, of disability, uh, concepts of what it means to be black, um, all of these concepts that, that relate to different stigmatized population groups are contested uh, and they have fuzzy boundaries and, and, and different people do use sometimes different definitions. But I think the definition that's most widespread or common, uh, certainly within community organizations, communities of people with intersex variations, now I think there's a, there's a, a quite a common definition that comes from the United Nations, from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, that, that talks about intersex people being born with sex characteristics that don't fit medical or social norms for female or male bodies. Uh, and there are a wide number of intersex variations that have different impacts on, on our bodies. Um, uh, but, but I think we all share in common an experience of stigma and discrimination 
because our bodies are perceived as being different uh, and often perceived as being in need of medical intervention. Um, uh, but the stigma, I think, can, can impact people quite differently in different parts of the world. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and that, that might come through the conversation today. It's also important to acknowledge that, that intersex traits can become evident at many different life stages. Increasingly, intersex traits, the traits that make people intersex, that make bodies different, um, can be identified prenatally. Um, they can also be identified at birth. Uh, or during puberty, um, or even at different times. Uh, for example, when somebody is trying to conceive a child. So we're a really diverse population. It's also important to say, I think, that we don't share an identity. Uh, we share a particular experience of stigmatization because our bodies are different. Um, so intersex people may have any of a range of different identities um, in the same way as the rest of the population. Thanks. Izan, do you have anything that you would like to add? And you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the uh, platform. And yeah, it's a common uh, uh, definition of intersex people around the world, I think. But also, sometimes we have a different assumption uh, uh, in our uh, local level. Uh, in in the context of Nepal, many people assume the intersex is the third gender, and sometimes we uh, we, we uh, like people assume we are the course of past life, and there is no understanding. Uh, now we are trying to uh, make understand to people on that the definition, which uh, uh, like Morgan said. Mm. Yeah. And so that understanding is important and particularly there's a difference between intersex and gender or there's um, there's a lot of diversity around um, intersex and it's not an identity like perhaps we understand it in the LGBT community. Um, and so there is an inherent difference, even though we're often brought together um, under the LGBTIQ umbrella there there's quite a lot of diversity amongst intersex community and between the intersex community and the LGBT community. Um, Julius, do you have anything to add there? Uh, it was very well put by Morgan. <laughs> yeah. Are we gonna end up agreeing for the whole session? Yeah. Well, that's okay, um, Julius, oh, yeah. sorry. I, I actually could can say something in addition to what Morgan said, and is that, um, and it's, it's because we have a, a we have a very difficult um, relationship with our past, because um, um, as um, as um, as uh, intersex have been uh, traditionally by mostly Western medicine, and in Christianity and maybe some other religions. We, we be, we've been having a complex relationship with uh, these factors. They have caused a situation in which um, we intersex people normalize the structural violence that exists against us. And we have normalized that for uh, maybe centuries because we have existed and we are recognized in all the indigenous cultures of the world. There is a name for us. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that, that name is uh, is for reasons is being used to identify um, identities of gender diversity, but not always um, that should be the right representation of like how some indigenous cultures uh, use the word for intersex people, but that word is being used today for uh, describing diversity within that particular uh, group, okay? Mm -hmm. So th that's something that is important in the term intersex because as intersex is not something that people use to self-define uh, themselves, but is to highlight uh, the experience in life that we, we all have. And even though we have different variations in which is our 45 variations and each variation has multiple sub variations, there is something that we all have in common hmm. and we share that experience. And that's why we, we use this term intersex, which has more connections with the, that's those social aspects of sharing something that is a experience in life. 
And that's what I, what I want to say, because not every intersex person that can that, that, that actually can fit into within this definition will feel comfortable using the word intersex. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people that use a pathologizing um, terminology to define themselves and will not mm -hmm. define themselves intersex. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so that's just something yeah. I wanted to add. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a really complex history of both medical, the medicalization and pathologization of intersex, but also a really complicated um, social history. Um, some of it incredibly positive, but other times um, incredibly negative. Is that fair to say? I think that's very true. And if I could just, I mean, I, I think Aliana has made some really important points. Um, I, I think it's also important. I mean, I, I would also say that, that um, you know, in traditional Western legal systems, there were ter terms used that are now thought of as pejorative words, like mm -hmm. Aphrodite, that actually created a place for people. Um, mm -hmm. And medicalization has essentially upended or um, disrupted those historical models mm -hmm. uh, and taken uh, the treatment of intersex people out of a legal framework and into a medical one. Yeah. But, uh, and Aliana is also completely right to identify, um, you know, a, a, a multiplicity or, or a, a, a range of different words that people will use. So, I mean, all four of us here, I think we will have, we, we knew our bodies were different and we knew our bodies were stigmatized before we'd ever heard of the word intersex. Hmm. Um, and we may well have encountered other traditional language to describe our bodies before we've heard the word intersex. And I think this is something that Isan has written about. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and often the old languages in different cultures are quite stigmatizing or thought of as quite stigmatizing now. And intersex is a term that, that I mean, some people will find that stigmatizing as well. Um, but often the stigma is, is because of the kinds of misconceptions that we layer on top of the experience of being different. Mm. Um, and I know that certainly in countries like Australia, and I think also in Ottawa and New Zealand, you know, different people mm. will use different language in different settings to avoid mm. stigma uh, and to avoid misconceptions mm. as well. So if people are talking about intersex as a gender identity or as mm. a sexual orientation, or even as a third sex, then, then people are probably gonna avoid using that word. Um, yeah. And people will use different language to make themselves understood and comprehensible. Mm. Yeah. Actually, I could just kind of interject right there uh, in, the, in the context of Africa or Uganda in particular. Uh, Intersex has become, I mean, it's, it's intersex people are wary and kind of thinking whether it is appropriate to use that term. And as intersex activists, we have, uh, Morgan, you know that, that we have deliberated upon the definition that you just gave uh, over several years, trying to come to a common um, kind of defining way to, to represent who we actually are, as diverse as we are. But in Africa and in Uganda, we have another dimension of misappropriation, being that the introduction of the word arrived with um, LGBT as well. It came, within, it came within that bracket, so it arrived as LGBTI, not as intersex on its own. And that was helpful then because there was absolutely no uh, platform to to engage around or to engage with around these issues but then the problem is that now it is impossible to define intersex even with all these nice you know nice ways that we, uh, formulations that we have come up with as intersex activists globally it is impossible it has become impossible to disaggregate intersex from LGBT. It is almost impossible to talk about sex characteristics uh, without them being covered up or immersed in sexual orientation and gender identity. 
So uh, like Morgan and Eliana was what um, uh, alluding to the to, to the different structural violences that we we face. Intersex people in Africa are facing that kind of structural dilemma. Mm -hmm. This time not from education or healthcare, but within the LGBTI um, organizing spaces that we, it is so difficult for us to remove our issues and our definition, the definition of who we are from the wider mm -hmm. sexual orientation and gender identity discourse. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add something because Julius brought something very interesting and I wanted to highlight from Colombia, which is in South America, uh, an, an experience that happened in situations where there is, a, there is a strict division in genders and it's a visually and morphologically a visible difference that exists between and between what we assume is the, is a male body and what we assume is a female body. So this uh, exaggerate uh, dimorphism almost that makes a man and a woman to be so distinctively different uh, creates a situation in which uh, in violent countries or countries that, that have normalized violence as a way of potentially a cultural behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. Intersex people in particular in those kind of countries where actually being in between or not being very well defined creates extreme anxiety. And that anxiety results in invisibility or actually in seeking coercive interventions to somehow being able to be not perceived or visible, okay? Mm -hmm. So one of the things you will find in Colombia is that the intersex movement in Colombia is very, very invisible. And it's a country of 45 million people. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in New Zealand, because it's the country I live in, I find more intersex visibility. And it's just mm -hmm. because here in New Zealand, there is a process of maybe, uh, I will say that that's that intense dif difference that exists in Colombia between a man and a woman mm -hmm. is not that strong. So it, it enables kind of intersex people to feel a little bit more safe and comfortable about maybe exposing themselves. But a mm -hmm. country that is 10 times the size of, of, of New Zealand you will not see a, a movement, even uh, a collective mm. uh, movement, because people are simply just afraid to even be associated with that. They prefer to kind of yeah. uh, normalize themselves to be safe and actually to be able to, to live because that's it's, it's actually a life and death situation most of the times. And I think mm. it's not different from Africa and other parts of the world. So, so what I'm hearing is that, you know, with in terms of the experiences that intersex people might face, they're obviously geographical context and, and so forth uh, plays a part in, in this, but um, there's medical discrimination, there's social discrimination, there's legal discrimination. Um, you know, it, it's kind of um, all encompassing. This, this webinar is, a, is about sexual health and reproductive rights. Um, I guess, what is your experience there? What kind of... Um, sexual health and reproductive rights issues do intersex people face? Um, and I obviously I know that one big part of the advocacy that, that all of you on the panel have been involved in is um, um, around uh, unconsensual uh, surgeries, which obviously is a sexual health and reproductive rights um, issue. Um, you know, what other ones exist and which ones are, do you want sexual health and reproductive rights uh, practitioners to really focus on? Um, and I might go to Essan because we haven't heard from them for a little while. Uh, yeah, I I wanted to link the previous point. Um, yeah, still uh, within the intersex um, community, we uh, haven't uh, raised the uh, sexual and reproductive health rights issues because we are very uh, young uh, organization and our movement is very young. While we are um, uh, like uh, uh, in Nepal, LGBTI movement started in two thousand. Um, uh, 2001, uh, but uh, we intersex uh, people and our issues always overshadow uh, within the border LGBT movement. That's why 
our issues uh, mostly removed from the wider LGBT uh, movement. That's why people still, uh, there is no uh, knowledge on intersex uh, uh, issues. Uh, that's why we uh, couldn't uh, uh, discuss on HRSR within our community. And also uh, uh, the intersex HRSR issues is overshadowed within the uh, LGBT uh, HRSR issues because uh, most of the organization and other movement, they assume uh, there, there is some uh, mainstream LGBT organization, they also work on that. That's why our uh, HRHR issues totally um, uh, not discussed with the uh, LGBTI HRHR issues. And that's why we couldn't, uh, yeah, we, it's not the uh, like uh, uh, part of the discussion within yeah. the community and also outside the community. Yeah. So what I hear in, in Nepal is that um, there really is no discussion around SRHR, that it's such a nascent intersex movement is so nascent that they haven't had those discussions. And that the link with the LGBT movement is, um, you know, they're focusing on their issues, which aren't necessarily bringing to the forefront intersex yeah. issues. Is that right? I think there are some really important issues that Isan has raised that, that are relevant to, to sexual yeah. and reproductive health. So, I mean, not having knowledge about your own body uh, and the parts that it has, has, has an impact on, on, on your ability to make decisions about your body, uh, including its sexual and reproductive health. Um, and, and the assumptions of other people about your body and, you, and your identity also have implications for your sexual and reproductive health. Um, so for example, um, uh, I, I have for decades used testosterone and, and um, uh, every so often I have a bone density test. Uh, and recently I had a bone density test and I had to go to a women's clinic to get a bone density test and everything is pink. Uh, and there, there's an assumption in that clinic about the, about the nature of the population that will use that service. Uh, and, and clearly, I mean, I, I didn't fit the, the kind of the idea of, of, of who their patients are going to be. Um, uh, and me, I was able to navigate that quite easily uh, because I've now got a lot of, I've got decades of experience. But, but assumptions about who we're supposed to be we can affect what services we have access to uh, mm -hmm. and the ways in which we can manage our health. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I also think that um, Eliana has talked about a, a coercive social environment in Colombia where people are encouraged to pass as normal, uh, to appear as best as normal as they can to survive. Um, and, and Lana, you've also talked about forced and coercive medical interventions, which I think are issues in all of our countries. Um, and one of the key issues with those is that they can impact, uh, they have adverse consequences for our sexual function and sensation. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the coercion uh, and the social norms that lead to coercion, uh, in, you know, that they they are they affect our right to bodily integrity, our right to bodily autonomy. Um, so these are all sexual and reproductive health issues. Mm. Yeah, and I think I, I, I could also add to that, um, Morgan. Just before before we lose that um, that line of thought that you've introduced, uh, you know, the thought of or the reality of having to hide. Um, our bodies out of shame for the context of Africa. And I think pretty much everywhere, really, it affects mm. people. There's that element of shame that we pick up as, as soon as we begin to understand that we are not, you know, we have to avoid certain situations or, for example, in the West, they would, you, you, you're being forced to see the doctor every so often. There's a sense of shame that comes with with who you are and how how your body is, um, and for us here, really, that body shame results in people avoiding doctor visits. 
Mm. Uh, in Africa, a doctor visit is really not something that you will have very often. It's a, it's a totally different uh, story, but uh, access to healthcare is a challenge, you know, mm. across the board, not just for intersex people, but when it comes to intersex people with all the body shame that occurs at the very first visit you attempt, whether it is at a referral hospital deep in a rural village, or even before what we call traditional, uh, mm. traditional medicine men, the kind of messaging that you get from there in a, a context or a society where endowment is celebrated of any kind, whether it is breasts for women or penises for men, uh, it is something, it's an achievement in itself to be endowed in, in a particular way in our, in our culture. So when that is lacking, um, and a lot of this endowment is seen way before um, you get sick or anything. We have rituals or passages to add to, to, to malehood. There, there are all kinds of passages, passage, rites of passage that happen here, that men have to be circumcised in certain tribes and women have to undergo certain rites to womanhood. So when you have issues with your genitals, that sense of shame, that sense that you're not as sexual as everybody else uh, affects your your sexual reproductive health kind of sense, and there's a, there's a big assumption or a large um, a large, scale, a large scale assumption that intersex people are also asexual. That you know we are we have these bodies that are that are you know are not typical. Therefore, we are not sexual beings. We we are not we shouldn't feel have have. Um, a need for sexual reproductive health information or knowledge, because what do we need it for anyway? <laughs> you know, uh, you probably are incapable of um, uh, bringing children into the world or having a sexual encounter with somebody. So what? Why, why would you need this kind of information? So all of this misinformation, and this kind of messaging that comes to us affects um, our sexual and, and, and uh, reproductive health. Mm -hmm. right. I would like to mention something on, on uh, to, com to maybe complement uh, something that Julius just mentioned, and and it's, and it's regarding um, uh, one of the comp complex elements about the as so in one way they consider us as sexual beings, uh, maybe because uh, nobody will understand how you know to perform that act with us. They, let's see, let's say that that's the way, but actually, uh, most of intersex persons the type of surgeries that, that are performed and in them when they are babies are surgeries to conform a body to what we call an endosex, endosex female body because it's easier to make a hole than to make a pole. Okay, so that's what, uh, and so it is more, it is likely or more likely that, um, that the, the way on how a surgery will lead to is actually to normalize the body in, in, into that direction. Obviously, there is both directions, but it's more likely that there are more, um, more uh, like uh, modifications leading to, in that way. And, and often, the way these surgeries are performed, which is obviously we already agree that is unnecessary and mainly on cosmetic sense, is just to make sure that that vagina can be pen penetrated. Uh, through heterosexual intercourse. And they do these surgeries in a way that um, I find this cognitive dissonance really, really insane. I've, I've, I've heard doctors that are against a female genital mutilation and they are very vocal about that. And those same doctors advocate for surgeries for intersex people. And I don't understand how, what is the cognitive dissonance. So they say in one way that they are against female, female genital mutilation because it's done in a rudimentary way by non-doctors and it has a lot of cultural attributions to it. But, but because these surgeries are, are done in a healthcare setting by a doctor, someone that studied a few years at university and, and there is all this level of authority, then they are not barbaric anymore. Mm. Okay, but they, I don't know how they find not barbaric using dildos in a baby that is one year old, and actually not just once through the whole, all the childhood until that 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 girl or boy is is ten or twelve, okay. Every time, every few months, all these very uh, harmful medical interventions on on a baby, not just one surgery, multiple surgeries, 
multiple interventions. And it just it creates a sense of trauma that is really hard to picture. A lot of people is terrorized by hearing about female genital mutilation. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't know why people don't feel those, those same horrors when it's not just mm -hmm. one surgery, but multiple, and then horrendous practices just to ensure that a vagina I made is, can be mm -hmm. penetrated later on in life. I just cannot uh, understand why doctors feel comfortable about that. Yeah. Yeah. Genital. I, think are, I think there are multiple reasons why, 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 why that's the case, Eliana. I mean, I, I think one of the reasons is, is a, a, a very um, heteronormative uh, and very, I don't know, sexist, actually gender stereotypes play into this a lot. The ideas of normality. Uh, and fitting gender roles. So, so th these issues that, that Eliana describes, um, they, they, they do affect infants and young children. They also affect adolescents uh, and not all intersex people, but very many of us. Um, and um, they, they happen wherever medicine is accessible. So in Australia, we have like a, a legal judgment just a few years ago called Ricala, where the judge in the case described how genital surgery on the child had uh, uh, enhanced the appearance of her female genitalia, which, which is language that you, uh, it, it's quite extraordinary uh, to, to hear a judge describe as acceptable um, in a young preschool child. Um, so um, I think that, there, there is then, um, so I think there is this heteronormativity, and this is really what links intersex and LGBT populations together in terms of the experiences. But I actually wanted to say something else as well. And, and that is, I mean, I agree with Julius that there is this notion that intersex people are asexual, um, but there is also a notion that we are hypersexual uh, and that somehow we are going to be able to satisfy with we have the best of both worlds. I mean, I've actually heard somebody tell me that, um, you know, um, because we have both parts and somehow that's intriguing or sal you know, there's a lot of salacious interest in intersex bodies. Yeah. Um, I think that um, uh, surgeries on intersex babies is one of kind of more of the visible um, and known kind of um, issues that the intersex community has been really building a movement towards and, and trying to create legal change. But it's also one of the ones that as an organisation as Edge Effect, it's the one of the ones that we have had some connection with in the humanitarian space, um, working in Cox's Bazaar, just doing, you know, the kinds of things that we do, organisational um, um, kind of assessing and research and training. And because we're an LGBTIQ plus organisation, um, having people come to us saying there's a baby born in the Cox's Bazaar refugee camp and that they need a referral so this baby can get surgery and, you know, be normalised. And even in such an extreme place like Cox's Bazaar, that kind of thing is happening. And, of course, we didn't give them a referral to, to a hospital, but... Um, to an intersex organization um, to, you know, maybe have some other discussions about, you know, different worldviews and choices that can be had. Um, but I guess in terms of uh, genital um, surgeries, there's a, there's a lot of stuff happening there around informed consent or lack of informed consent around a lack of education, but also thinking about um, the future sexual rights and health of um, intersex persons. It, it's, um, it's not just something that happens as a baby and that's it, um, but, but it appears to be much more of a lifelong thing, which does create more challenges to, to, to reproductive health and to sexual health for many people. Maybe there's, there's odd occasions where surgery is important and necessary and life-saving, 
But over the whole, it appears to me that the effects of that have negative consequences on sexual health and reproductive rights life, lifelong. It's actually contradictory to sexual health and reproductive rights. Would that be fair to say? To go. <laughs> I think you can go, Morgan. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, so, some medical interventions are necessary. Uh, yeah. And um, I think that can cause issues in countries where access to medicine is difficult. Um, and I know that ESAN ha has fundraised for, for people to access surgery. Um, and, and we try our best to support that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in many cases, medical interventions are driven by gender stereotypes uh, or cultural norms in the same way that FGM is, is, is driven by gender stereotypes and cultural norms. And actually, you know, the, the, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women ha have positioned those forced or coercive medical interventions in the same way that they talk about FGM or forced marriage, that's harmful practices. Um, so um, I think that's important to recognize that, that I think the intersex movement is about eliminating harmful practices uh, rather than trying to stop all surgery because some surgeries are important. Um, but really, we're also about protecting people's right to bodily integrity. It, when your bodily integrity is, is interfered with, that really mm. has profound effects in, in terms of experiences of trauma. Um, and as Julia said, not wanting to access, not wanting to see a doctor. Um, so, yeah, there are lifelong consequences. Yeah. Also, early, you know, surgery can affect people's need for ongoing monitoring and, and, and uh, you know, access to healthcare. For, so, you know, for me, my body has not produced testosterone properly. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I've needed testosterone. I've needed, I, I need to have monitoring to make sure my bone health is good um, and other aspects of my health are okay. And I think it's often forgotten that, that, that sometimes there is pressure to, for people to undergo surgery, particularly if they, if for example, somebody is a woman uh, and they have testes, that then the testes might be removed. Um, That's my uh, case, actually. <laughs> you're sorry? Describing, you're describing what I'm feeling yeah. right I'll now. I'll let you talk, Eliana, yeah? <laughs> I should stop talking. No, the, um, I mean, I, I will describe that situation and. I one of the testes that I have is is it's internal and and um and I've been I was experiencing health issues but not very related to that and then I had this uh, doctor suggesting that they, that I should do that surgery and it very persuasive I'm a pharmacist and he was actually persuading per, being very persuading with me he was convincing me that I should undergo that that surgery uh, and one, one of the reasons was because they are not going to help me with my hypogonadism that I have, which is causing osteoporosis and bone fractures and a lot of problems, actually problems that are leading me to be disabled. I have to use um, a walking stick and I'm 32 and it's really not the right thing just because doctors are afraid to give um, a dose of hormones that is too high that can induce a cancer that I it's just maybe one percent at least or the least to say which is what they're trying to calculate because we don't know what is the risk of developing a cancer uh, if a testis is not in the right temperature um, because that's usually the fear is used uh, but we are not pro um, if we use that fear or that risk uh, one in every 10 women can develop breast cancer, but we are not doing mastectomies all over the world because we are afraid of that risk. And it's actually more 10 or 20 times higher the risk of a test is becoming cancerous. But then the surgeries in us, in intersex people, especially um, people with androgen insensitivity syndrome, it's, it's normal practice and it happens everywhere and it, it happens constantly. And it happened to one of my dearest friends here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, not 
not long ago, like a few months. And, 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 and the process of, and, and of misinformation that doctors have is really unfair because they, they are really not having, uh, they, are, they don't have the evidence to actually say categorically A or B or C and give you the options. And we have a disability mm -hmm. act in New Zealand in which doctors need to give all the options with totally, totally, totally symmetric way. And that's not what's happening in, in, in here. So I'm just giving an example of, of, of this country. Uh, just imagine other countries that are perceived to have less development on, on sexual and, uh, and reproductive health, uh, sorry, sex and reproductive health, um, human rights. So this is something I wanted to mention. Now, one point I want to complete now this is that there is a pandemic happening where I come from, South America. And I've been, I've been connect, connected with my region and I've been trying to help, especially a lot of intersex babies that have been born in the pandemic or during the pandemic. And why I'm helping them because there, there is the, the health systems have disrupted and they, a, lo a lot of the times intersex babies need a, a specific treatments uh, to be alive, not to die. Okay, one of the conditions which is called congenital hadrenal hyperplasia. Uh, in, in, in some cases when babies are born with this variation, which is one in 400 females, so it's actually a very common variation they need uh, hydrocortisone and fluidocortisone because otherwise um, they, they, they started to lose a lot of salt and the baby actually can have an adrenal crisis and die. Actually that happened, eight persons died just, just to mention you, uh, like what, what is happening and oh, eight persons that I know uh, in my community died because of lack of hydrocortisone because hydrocortisone is being used for COVID patients and we are not necessarily an important population. So let's better save normal people and then Let's let these babies, deformed babies, you know, die because this is pretty much what is happening in Brazil, in Peru, in Venezuela, in all these countries that are dealing with uh, huge peaks of the of the COVID. But can you believe what is insane that in uh, in, in these environments where uh, there is not enough resources and hospitals are crowded with COVID patients, you know what is still happening? Surgeries, and these surgeries are still happening. And as an example. These surgeries are happening with those babies that cannot access hydrocortisone. And this is the worst you can do because when you do a surgery on a baby with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is usually a clitoridectomy, which is to reduce the size of the clitoris to make it look more female, in, 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 you know, then you induce something that is called adrenal crisis. Okay, and an adrenal crisis, you need to adjust how much medication you need to give. And trust me, as a pharmacist, I'm telling you, the hardest thing is to calculate the dose of medication for the baby. You, we have to use so many formulas and you can even give too much or too little and, and actually you can cause a lot of uh, harm in that baby just because you are so obsessed and fixated in having a surgery that is completely unneeded. And trust me, even more during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something I just wanted to share this experience mm -hmm. that I had. So not only has pathologization made up a big part of the way in which intersex is understood and defined, um, I guess, in the world, um, but on top of that, the you know there's there is evidence, there is research around um, you know how to support the health and well-being of of different intersex people but often what's happening is um i guess a a cultural um medical model still being enforced without um necessarily input from some of the research that's happened and been happening yeah and they're still prioritizing it above you know, are they essential services in in COVID or in Cox's Bazaar, um, you know, which is one of the world's largest refugee camps. Um, we did talk a little bit then about, um, I guess, the importance of the medical system as well um, and sexual health and reproductive um, services. What would make a more inclusive service um, a more inclusive SRHR service. What kind of things would SRHR practitioners have to do um, so that it is 
a space where intersex persons would feel comfortable to start discussing these kinds of issues. Um, maybe Isan, because we haven't spoken to you for a little bit. Yeah, uh, I think uh, in Nepal, uh, there is no uh, um, no knowledge on intersex variation and intersex bodies. It's still, um, uh, I have been uh, raising the intersex issues of the UN mechanism, UN mechanism uh, made the concluding concluding observation to Nepal government uh, to wait for the people to make their own decision on their body. Uh, but still, uh, there is uh, no uh, any um, knowledge, and also there is no any medical protocol or guideline. That's why always uh, doctor uh, uh, suggesting to uh, suggest to to the intersex person to be fix their body and to be normal uh, in the society, and also there is it's very little understanding uh, on intersex body. There is no any uh, discussion within other uh, uh, stakeholders who are working on HRHR issues. They assume um, uh, intersex, uh, Julius uh, said, they, they, they assume intersex have a, have a ambiguity, amb, amb, ambiguous genital health. That's why they don't uh, need any um, like a uh, health services, and uh, they assume intersex people uh, are asexual people, and uh, there is no uh, information. And it's still a few days ago, one doctor they uh, published the news: intersex is a problem. And a few day, uh, few weeks ago, we visited the uh, doctor, and doctor uh, suggesting uh, to the people who doesn't have uh, any uh, health issues based on their genitalia because uh, he has uh, ambiguous genitalia, and the uh, so doctor suggested uh, to uh, the person for the treatment because um, because. Uh, they, they, they think people have to have their own baby. That's why they are suggesting. So I think uh, we have uh, so many issues and um, most of the time our issues, our health issues are uh, clubbed within the um, LG, other LGBT issues like uh, hormone therapy and uh, like uh, uh, breast impl implantation and uh, some kinds of surgery which is related to, which is uh, like uh, for, for uh, trans people and they also think uh, intersex people have the same needs on HR, HR. that's why they uh, clubbed our health uh, issues with those uh, particular uh, health health services discussion so i think um, uh, to make inclusive uh, on HR, HR, so many uh, organizations who are working on HR, HR issues, they need to understand the variation of intersex uh, body and they need to understand the experiences of intersex uh, people who are facing uh, the different kind of discrimination in the different structure like uh, health setting, legal setting and other uh, setting of the society. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I was wondering if I can share just one one uh, comparison between what is the traditional model and what would be an affirming model that would be more helpful for intersex people. If I can just share that uh, that little thing. Um, Do you have sharing rights? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to see how to do that. So what I hear from you, um, Esan, while um, Ileana is putting that up is that, um, you know, you really need to take a systems-wide approach in Nepal, um, really looking from human rights mechanisms, as well as education and training and, and research, because really it's a lot of support needs to happen in Nepal. Um, thanks, Eliana. Yeah. So that would be something for just to keep. Yeah. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah. So uh, actually, I can I can show it again. Sorry. Uh, 
and I quickly quickly present. Sorry. Is that working now? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So I'm not very good in technology. Yeah, so I think this summarizes a little bit and maybe there is th things to fix in this uh, thing uh, that I, I developed this source. And I think Morgan maybe <laughs> is more preparing to find this right or not. And maybe there is more things to add here. Um, but I think um, the, the traditional model that uh, we, we, we've been subjected, most of us, and I think most of intersex people at least age, uh, you know, 10 and ahead, they've been subjected at least to this, all these uh, elements of the traditional model, um, in which, which is very narrow and it doesn't really recognize multiple tr truths um, that uh, sometimes doctors simplify and and, and you know, it's a, not even using a pragmatic sense and approach because often when doctors approach LGBTQI issues, they use a pragmatic approach in which um, self, you know, the, the way of how you are recognize your, your emotions or how you recognize the, the, how you love someone or how you identify yourself is something that doctors tend to minimize and not really uh, pay attention to. But they are not even paying attention to the diversity of structures that can exist in a body. And then they simplify the intersex bodies. And then th they define sex just by a specific single factors. And that single factor that Judith was mentioning, which is just what I can visibly see. So there is a penis, or there is a vagina, or there is something in between. And that pretty much defines all the way we've been treated. So because there are cases in which a, in, an intersex person is born with a vagina. And then the, all the assumptions that are made and uh, that this person is just gonna carry on. But then when they find out that this person has XY chromosomes and they has undescended testes and cannot reproduce or cannot have babies and all these sort of things, started to create this sort of sense of like, oh, we need to fix this person. We need to remove her testes, even though her testes are producing estrogen and they and there is really no evidence that uh, there is an increased risk of cancer, then this person is gonna be subjected to a very degrading uh, health system, okay? Mm. And then we can just go off and the, the same, the sex is a binary, which is something in, in medicine, when you open a book of medicine, uh, you, you will not find, you know, definitions for understanding on a normal way of how is an intersex body. You will only find the, our, the explanation of our, our anatomy in a, in a book of rare diseases. And, and it's one of those books that hardly anyone touches. And, and, and it's often like, it's kind of like a, how to do surgery on this type of disease kind of book, okay? So it is a very degrading uh, even way, if we, like it's impossible for even doctors to learn, even if they want to start seeing uh, this, uh, our existence as normal, uh, which, is, which is normal. It's like a, a non natural human variation. They will not be able even to, to use evidence, uh, the medicine, to learn about that, what is normal because all the all the um, all the research that exists, all the information that exists, all the books that they used to learn about this us is just all it, with a pathologizing lens. So it is all, almost for, also impossible to change that narrative, and it's a complex, but it's very complex to change that narrative. And I would say that yeah, that that's what I want to compliment here. I don't know, maybe Morgan has something else to say. Yeah. Well, maybe all of us might have something to say. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I, I mostly agree with the, the model that Eliana has outlined. And I think it's important to recognize that some of the language and concepts there are contested. So there is a lot of debate about whether sex is a spectrum or sex is binary. And a lot of that debate kind of hinges on um, concepts of normality that essentially exclude intersex people from a binary model uh, and regard us as um, not relevant to the discussion about whether sex is binary or not. Um, but but I, so I would tend to think about sex characteristics existing on a spectrum because that's more precise a concept than sex. Sex has multiple different meanings in different contexts. Um, also, Thinking that the existence of intersex people depends upon a notion that sex exists on a spectrum can, can lead people down quite a narrow path from, from 
discarding the notion that sex is binary to adding a third category of sex and assuming that that's going to satisfy the needs of people with intersex variations. Um, and that's kind of unhelpful because, um, you know, Eliana, uh, uh, Julius and Isan and myself have different identities and different sex assignments. We are understood in different ways by our legal systems. And in some cases, we might agree with the way that we've been assigned. In other cases, we don't. Um, but kind of regarding us all as, as being this kind of homogenous third category can be very harmful. Um, but there is some work that's happened uh, both in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and in Australia to work out better ways of counting people that respect our identities and our social status. Um, and I'm just sharing uh, in, in the pan to panelists and attendees, uh, a, a new Australian Bureau of Statistics standard that, that offers a way of counting people with intersex variations that respects who we are and our diversity. Yeah. And I would share also the New Zealand one because it was just released today too, um, uh, Morgan, which mm -hmm. I think I think uh, the Australian one uh, in my eyes is better, but uh, at least in the in the one in, in Aotearoa, uh, they are trying to do their best attempt to count uh, people born with variations of the sex characteristics, yeah. completely independent from gender and sex. Yeah. And it's a question that is obviously well framed to avoid uh, misconceptions and maybe trans people or other people use this a way to self-identify uh, because it's, it's very well ex explained. So, yeah. 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 Um, I think I would like to kind of just add a little bit to that. I think both of what Eliana and Morgan just said. Uh, what we would ask, in my own opinion, what would ask uh, or we would want health practitioners to know or do for intersex people is something that we probably cannot lump up in one, cannot present in a one a one size fits all kind of way in in a in a forum like this, um, because contextually this might differ. Uh, people in the global north might have a particular message for the healthcare providers there depending on the experience and on the context and the laws that prevail and the social and economic realities there. And that reality might become different once you move further down uh, you know, to where we are. The kind of um, messaging that we give to the healthcare providers in this part of the world might be different. And I think, what, what Morgan uh, alluded to earlier was that we are all working to ensure that there are no harmful practices, that whatever we are asking, the end result is that we avoid harmful practices towards intersex people and intersex children. But how that is framed and what that entails kind of has to be worked around depending on who you're talking to and what is at stake. You know, uh, so in our in our case, if it means that a child will be killed, if if you do not agree to certain things, then our language might change. We will work against the surgery, but we will probably give the parent some hope that we're going to see another doctor uh, who will. We, we we can't just come out and say, look. This cannot be done and that's it. Uh, and it's the right of this child. That kind of messaging will not work here because mm -hmm. when we get out of that um, conversation, the mother will be overcome with the mm -hmm. social pressure, the cultural pressure, and then she'll go to the next uh, solution, which is even worse, mm -hmm. <laughs> which means the child has to go, has, has to be sacrificed because if there's no hope, uh, mm -hmm. Then you know, so uh, there there the, are realities that we have to work around, but and we have been working on this in many of the intersex fora that we have had with Morgan, trying yeah. to see how we all support each other, mm -hmm. depending on the context where we are. But the the commonality of all our advocacy and our work around sexual uh, and reproductive health and rights for intersex people is to ensure that whatever uh, outcome we get results in uh, mitigating or eliminating harmful practices mm -hmm. in whichever form those 
are presented in any, in any context or any culture. Yeah, so if you're an SRHR practitioner and you want to be more inclusive in your work and think about, you know, what are the needs and rights of intersex people, what they should do is connecting in with local, if possible, intersex organisations to be able to start a relationship and start a discussion about what is the appropriate way to work together in this local context. Um, and I do want to just note that... Um, our intern Adi compiled a list of every intersex organisation that we could find internationally and we'll send it around to, to everyone. It is really, really important to have local partnerships with local organisations to be able to find out, you know, what their, what their needs are. Yeah. Um, can, can I just yeah. very quickly, I mean, I, I agree with Julius completely with, with, with what you said and, and, and I think I, I, I guess when I'm talking about human rights, I'm kind of gearing my language to an audience of people that's, that are involved in discussions around sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I think talking with parents and talking with families does require different language. And I think that local organizations will have a lot to say about the best language. And I, I also want to give an example that... that, that um, you know, I, I don't hear in Australia the 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 the, the, um, the, the argument that, that, that you know a kid's going to have surgery or may face infanticide. That's not an issue that happens in Australia. But I have heard doctors say it's either surgery or the foster care system. Yeah. So um, so I, I really don't think we're as far apart. Uh, in terms of the practices and beliefs that families and institutions have, as people might expect, you know, and I think this is this is one area I think where where there is a um, you know I, I think often when people talk about things like FGM that that, that are kind of a colonial attitude can seep into the discourse, uh, and it's it's a discourse that that kind of positions non-white people as being the victims and perpetrators of a practice that should end. But really, the, the practices that we're talking about here today affect people all around the world, including in, you know, white majority high income countries that, that position themselves as the experts on, on many human rights issues. Yeah. Um, we are going to be wrapping up in the next half an hour. So if if, pan if guests have any questions that they would like me to ask the panellists, please put it in the chat box. Um, and I also just, sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, because you, you mentioned that what would be things that um, um, human rights advocates or activists could do uh, in order to possibly help, you know, uh, our movement or inter uh, intersex issues. So. Uh, something that, they, and this happens quite a lot in the LGBTIQ+, plus, um, and I will exclude the I from there, LGBTQ+, plus, is that, so it's something that, um, it, that is, is mentioned and um, which is called othering, which is the othering, and, and it's kind of like a, a minimizing effort to uh, invisibilize our, 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 our stories that are very distinctive. Uh, to any other uh, letter of this alphabet of um, of rainbow or rainbow diversity, if you can call it rainbow, or if you can include all the intersex people within that rainbow, because not every intersex person feel that belongs to that rainbow. Um, I, one of the things I just wanted to to mention that is often um, it's, it's often uh, neg neglect. Uh, in LGBTI movements, is that when they when they are when there is a fight for for equality and non discrimination, which actually which, which is actually one of the uh, the rights that are integrated with the sexual and reproductive reproductive uh, human rights, which is a, a right to equality and non discrimination. Uh, in actually most of the countries of the world, actually I think all the countries, with the exception of nine, um, intersex people can be discriminated without any source of you know implication uh, because we are not uh, specifically protected in uh, the law and, and and this is one of the things that can just show that um, in many many countries that have advanced uh, LGBT 
LGBTQ plus rights, often we are left the last and we are forgotten and just wordings that can help us to potentially even by mistake be protected because sometimes we are protected by mistake when they use gender to conflate uh, intersex identities because that actually happened in Australia that <laughs> by mistake they were banning surgeries and they're like oh no 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 sorry in this case gender doesn't include intersex therefore we are not protecting intersex non-consensual unconsented surgeries okay so it's kind of like these things happen there is few countries that have this legal uh, you know conflations that are that accidentally might protect us from something and then then and then you will find that you know and then the language it is so important that when you are saying sexual orientation gender identity even if you might not understand or you want to understand you mention sex characteristics and variations of sex characteristics i actually wanted to show something that um it makes me a little bit upset <laughs> Uh, but it's fine. I think we are in a process of evolution, and we, we, we at one at one point we will be able to to be part of this, or at least make this visible. That when you read about like the theory of diversity, when you learn about what is intersectionality, you know, how like human diversity in terms of other aspects like uh, religion, or like actually as a human in terms of demographic diversity, and and even when you read, like, uh, you, you find that the, the, like the, the variation of sex is not something that is even a thing. And then you, you actually find that the, uh, and the, I'm speaking about like very um, well known uh, writers that are working, been working 40, 50 years in these issues of diversity, they are just not simply getting uh, who we are as is like we are unicorns or we, you know, we, we don't need to be understood because maybe, or we are too complex or maybe, you know, and when we speak about intersectionality, then we have these multiple colors and we speak about religions, races, languages and all that stuff. And, you know, no one really understands what is intersex and what is intersex and how these intersections are actually so that so important to, to be seen, especially for a 2% of the population or actually if you put all that 2% in a country, it's actually the whole population of Philippines. And it's a big group, you know, it's a group of people that uh, we love to be understood, you know, and but it's not happening. And I hope one day we will be able to include uh, these elements of um, Oh, those colors that are part of the, that makes us human, well, what makes us human, yeah. One of the ways that I've heard to describe the population of um, people with diverse sex characteristics is about the same as a population of people in the world with red hair. Um, I don't know how true that is, but that's something that I heard. Yeah, so people don't like to use that because like if you go oh. to Colombia, you will not find red hair people and then yeah. you say, oh, so they are at that uncommon, like the red hairs that you never find in Colombia. And then, you know, mm. or if you go to uh, maybe Uganda, you will not find red hair. So, mm. you know, but that's just, yeah. Yeah, I think that's why I liked it because um, my father's side of the family is Fijian and my grandfather was a redheaded Fijian. So unusual, but also you just never know, do you? Um, I think that um, I think that one of the things that, like it obviously, or it appears to me that intersex, sexual health and reproductive rights generally is just a very um, invisible and um, uncommunicated um, uh, topic as is intersex generally. Um, we've been talking about intersex um, persons' uh, connection and experiences to sexual health and reproductive rights. And we've talked about that a little bit, but what we don't talk about, and I think this is um, for the whole international um, development sector, when we're talking about these kind of things, um, let alone the humanitarian sector, um, which is quite different, is the difference between the need to be treated with dignity and respect and have bodily integrity um, and all of those things 
to get your right your your basic needs met but there's a difference between that and have a, and having sexual health and reproductive rights that are about flourishing lives and and sexual well-being and um, things that are are less about you know the kind of minimum standards to get by in terms of rights and more about what makes what rights do I have to have a flourishing um, life and and that's certainly not something that we talk about um, is is and I I guess that um, I would like to ask you, how could you imagine a world in which it's not just about accessing your basic needs to bodily integrity, um, but also have a, having flourishing sexual um, and health rights? Is that something that you could imagine, Julius? I need to hear the question again. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about, uh, and the conversation has been in a lot about um, sexual health and reproductive rights in the very basic necessities around having bodily autonomy and access to information, um, being treated with dignity and respect, but yeah. rights go beyond that. Rights, bodily autonomy rights should be going to a place where people have the ability to access and have the right to express their flourishing, um, you know, well-being around sexual health, um, sexuality, um, reproductive rights, reproductive health. What? How far? Since we're so far away, you know, is that what can we do to to move towards that space? And how important is that flourishing? Or should we only be focusing on, you know? the very basic needs at this point. Yeah, um, I, I think I would, I would like to first uh, point out that we, we have a lot of lip service um, around rights and, you know, and bodily autonomy for intersex people. There's a lot of talk uh, about this. And um, unfortunately, it's usually in places like this, in meetings either, uh, virtually now or earlier on in, in conferences and, and um, in those kind of spaces, a lot of lip service um, mm -hmm. where intersex is mentioned and issues around bodily autonomy. And um, I know people like Morgan and other people in, in Europe or II Europe have done uh, mixed, you know, they've done their own studies. And, and a lot of publications are out. I know there's the Darlington um, statement. We have had some, you know, small ways of talking about this in the Africa uh, intersex movement in a couple of small statements. But when, you know, when the chips are really down, there's no action, at least in, in I don't know about Australia because I don't live there. And it's one place I've actually not been to at all. But um, in Africa, where I am well versed, there's no action, you know, that is taken to meaningfully include intersex needs and bodies and um, in sexual reproductive programming. Um, there's no support even from our development partners or partners that we work with. Um, I, so it's still it's still a very extraordinarily sad um, in case of invisibility, really, that while we talk about it it, 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 it almost seems like people are not interested enough to make intersex issues and needs and realities as visible as they should be. It's not that people don't know. There, there seems to be an unwillingness, really, because you see that um, there's been a lot of attention, including research, uh, for every population's needs, including men who have sex with men, women who have sex with women, sex workers, HIV, uh, people living with HIV, people living with disabilities, all kinds of populations with all kinds of needs. And some of these kind of take their intersectionalities with us, with intersex people. You know, so for you to uh, make sure that you're recognized and 
you you have space to talk about body body autonomy and to make a case for this uh, as an intersex person you have to kind of shift position and go in a space where they're talking about disabilities for example or go in a, a space where they're talking about uh, men who have sex with men and their sexual health and, and you know you kind of have to combine certain things to occupy space but no intersex nobody seems to be inter uh, interested in really putting um you know action to intersex research or understanding what the needs are uh understanding what we mean when we say we need respect for bodily autonomy to actually really engage at that level so um and this is all across it's not even just in africa i believe mm. So for me, I think that that would be one of the areas that we need to kind of point and make make people listen and make you know ask for action, real action mm. towards inclusion in programming as a priority, not as just you know a mention because we we just kind of you know tag along in a lot of uh, mentions in documents in panels and all of this. So it, that has been a problem for me. I, I mean. mm. The great mighty footnote, often um, saying LGBTIQ+, plus, however, no, I, people, intersex people have been included in this. Yeah. Sorry, but Morgan. How many times have you had, say, the Darlington statement, in, you know, recited or referred to in a major international LGBTI conference, you know, or even the little mention in the Jakarta principles are around intersex. These are not brought to the fore in, in bigger pro programming spaces. But there's a bit of research that has been done by some people, maybe not Africans, but the larger intersex um, organized the larger intersex movement. But these, these are not referred to, these are not, um, you know. Yeah. Look, where I, I, from when people yeah. are doing programming? It's not that we don't have information. I, I agree with you. Okay. Yes, Morgan, please, please go ahead. Uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, the Darlington statement is a regional statement in Australia and, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and it was created because of those issues where, where we were we were not listened. We are, you know, we were not listened to. People made assumptions that because we were a small number of people, perhaps, or people without power, people who, who don't have representation in LGBTI organizations that claim to speak for us, um, that they, they go away and, and, and follow their pre-existing agenda. Um, and when we have spoken up historically and said, well, actually, what we want is something different, then we have historically found it a bit harder to justify why we have a different position to the LGBTI organizations that are supposed to speak for us. So, um, so the Darlington Statement was a response to that in, in many ways, and, and, a, and a, a document that kind of was, was our moment to... to agree amongst ourselves to our region what it is that we want to change um, and, and and it has been helpful for us here because of because it's it's focused on what we need in our region so it's not intended to work in Africa or in, in Asia or, or Latin America either but but um, for us it, it's been a useful tool to say well here, this is what we've agreed we need to have happen. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, trying to create change on the basis of that is like, a, it's, it's still a difficult story. It doesn't mean that people go, oh, okay, now we know and we're going to act on that. That, that hasn't happened. And um, yeah. I would like to, uh, a little bit of answering your, your initial question to Julius, that is like what I want or what I would like um, mm maybe for, for us, obviously, I, I, what I'm gonna say is gonna, be sound, gonna sound a little bit um, uh, crazy, but uh, I would like to us to come back to our origins, okay? And why I'm saying that, because uh, I've been doing this process the, during the pandemic times, so it's kind of like a process that I've done. I'm just trying to relearn our past because intersex bodies were loved and intersex bodies were respected in, their, in, in a way in many of those um, uh, 
as like uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give examples of like uh, the Nunawa people or uh, the Maori here in New Zealand or the the people the Musu people in my country in Colombia. They have stories in which they dis describe our experiences, and actually you can see how we celebrated being celebrated. And I would like to come a little back in that past in which we don't have those taboos and stigmas, and we can actually just have a fulfilled life. And actually, we are celebrated. We are saying, "Oh, you know, um, like the case of this intersex king of Hawaii that nobody knows about, but it's a fantastic story that I just can show, like how how mm. how like." how amazing it was to be intersex maybe before these notions of Christianity and binaries were implanted in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they even called their intersex king with the acronym of intersex, which is a word that is, it was used in, uh, back in the days in Hawaii in, in the 1400s, which is the word mahu. Uh, this is a word that today is more mostly associated with, uh, with um, gender identity, cultural gen gender identities, but at that time was uh, in the in the books of history. Mm -hmm. David Mahu, who described the story of this king, uh, he describes it clearly as a person that was born with a variation of sex characteristics. And, and why I'm saying this, because we, you, just, you just need to be a biologist that has a very trained eye, go in the nature and just to see all these multiple colors and variations of sex, sex characteristics that exist in animals. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna fall like a, because I can just quickly show something. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry that this is so visibly like intersex in terms of chimera because it's one of the variations that exist in the natural in the in the natural um, but like I'm gonna show this one you know this is a very visible very visible variations of sex characteristics in in some animals okay and why they are very visible because they are chimera there is not really many cases of human being chimera but uh, here, like we can see cases in which we are there, evolution brought, brought us there. We have these living beings around us. We might eat a chicken and we don't need not, not knowing that the chicken is intersex, okay? Because there's multiple variations in ways of being intersex, not just like this very visible and obvious way of being intersex, which is having this uh, genandromorphism, which is having like uh, different cells that have different types of chromosomes and co creating almost a symmetric half-half, um, which is like very visible. And why I say very visible? Because it's a way to show that we there, we've been here, and we were there, and if we are here after evolution, it's because there's not, not natural variations are, um, are happening. And then we deserve to be part of this uh, experience of, you know, of being in this universe. And that's what I want us for our future. I just want us like in, in our future, just to feel the same feeling that those animals in the animal, in the animal kingdom have, they are just existing without, any other, like, I don't know, a butterfly making a surgery on that butterfly because she was born with, I don't know, too many colors or too many, too many female colors, or that's, that, that's what I want. I want us just to simply not even noticing that we are different, simply just existing and hopefully celebrated. Yeah. <sighs> I don't think I can say anything that just, you know, that was a really, I really hope that as well. And um, I really want to thank you for, you know, for, for letting, for sharing how difficult it is, how difficult the invisibility is, how difficult it is to, um, you know, be invisibilized and um, silenced by the broader LGBTIQ plus as such community um, as a member of that community. Um, so yeah, I, I really hope that as well. A flourishing life. Um, we're gonna wrap up. We've only got five minutes left. Um, I, I guess I would like to ask people if there's any last remarks. Um, maybe Asan, we can start with you. Looks like they're greeted. He's muted. Maybe Julius, while uh, Hassan. Oh, no. You're right there, Sam. 
Well, I can I can speak while Isan uh, gets ready. Um, not that I have much to say, really just um, um, a word of thanks for my fellow panelists. I think that we, we have tried in a very short while to cover some of the pertinent things or issues that we have um, around inclusion and or exclusion from sexual rights and uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. So really that, that, that's it. Just thanks everybody. Thanks Lana for putting this together, making it happen. Uh, thanks Morgan and Eliana for always showing up. Yeah, that's it. Thanks Esan. I know, I don't know if you're there now or <laughs> and Adi and everybody. Yeah. Esan? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, any last, any last remarks? Sorry, I lost the connection. So yeah, thank you very much, Lana. And, and I'm very, yeah, it's very nice to see Morgan, Juliana, and Eliana. Uh, so yeah, and um, yeah, I would uh, see one point and if you uh, mention uh, LGBTI in your um, working area, uh, it's not inclusive uh, for the intersex people. Inclusive should be particip participatory and the uh, meaningful. Otherwise, intersex people always left um, within the border LGBTI, uh, like border uh, area. So thank you, Lana giving this platform and thank you very much audience to learn from us and yeah hmm. no thank you asan and you know the truth be told is that the eye is invisible and it's so constantly invisible and it has been which is why i had this panel tonight is the first of the four because um you know to alleviate some of the overwhelming invisibility um yeah uh, Eliana, do you have any last any last comments or remarks? Oh, um, Purangi to Hihinga, Purangi Omahara, Purangi Ohaura, Purangi Hawanawa, Tekati Otia Hearoha Fakato, Hearoha Putamai, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Um, my last uh, closing rem remarks that I want just to give is that um, that just a rem reminder for people to understand that intersex is not a gender identity, it's not a social construct, or it's a cultural construct itself. We are different. We have different colors and variations. We might might would like people to understand who we are, but because we want to be loved, not because we really need to be understood, but because you just want to be part of this existence, and we just want to have a fulfill fulfillment experience in this uh, planet we live in. And I would say it's not about who you love or who you identify traditionally or culturally. It's simply how you uh, you build. And the only th the one thing I want to, to just to make sure is that we can act as a collective because we suffer from the same root and causes that lead to ostracization of gender and uh, sexual minorities. So there are a lot of in intrinsic elements that uh, we, we, we share in common, but we have very different experiences. So it is very important that we don't do othering, that we allow these experiences to be known and that we sh allow intersex people speak for themselves. And that when every time we use the I in the LGBTIQ acronym, we actually do our efforts to make sure that that I is included there. And it's not just sort of like a, a check to make sure that I'm not missing any letter, because it is very important for people to understand that we, we need to be differentiated. It's not an intersection. We are not an intersection. We are not a race, a disability, maybe, but we are not an intersection. We are a core identity of, of the LGBTIQ elements that cannot be defined with other letter. So that's all I want to say. Thank you so much for inviting us, Lana, and thank you so much for bringing up these intersect issues tonight. Thank you, Eliana. Um, it's been my pleasure to have you here. Um, Morgan, as a, as a fellow Australian, I think that um, I, I'm going to slightly disagree with you. I think that probably what we have in common is two people that have, um, you know, that kind of sit under the LGBTI 
um, is not just heteronormativity, but the confines of binarism that they're imposed on our lives um, in different ways, of course. Um, but do you have any last remarks or? Well, um, I, I, I just want to thank Lana, thank you for, for organising this uh, and for people in the IWG in, in, in the subcommittee to thank you for being here. And I hope that people that are here today have gotten a lot out of it and it's been recorded. So I hope maybe other people will see it as well within your, your, your group and organization. Um, and it's just always wonderful and a pleasure to be on a panel together with Julius and Isan and Eliana. So um, yeah, thank you. I mean, you know, this word binarism, I, I don't really understand quite yet what it means. But certainly, you know, heteronormativity, even transphobia, ableism, all of these, you know, concepts are about norms, constructing a, a normal and an abnormal. And, and we're certainly on the end of, on, on the, the harsh end of, of, of those assumptions. Hmm. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you so much, all of you. It's been a pleasure to be here today. Yeah. Um, so again, thank you to our guests, um, Julius, Ileana, Morgan and Asan, and thank you to IWAG for, for hosting um, and the LGBTIQ plus subworking group for, for hosting this as well. Um, and um, if we can go to the PowerPoint slide, please, Adi. Um, we will, uh, this is part of a series. So this is the number one webinar. Um, and the, the first webinar of the, of the rank and we will be having um, three more this year. Um, uh, the second one, um, another under-researched one is cisgender lesbian women and bisexual women and SRHR. Um, and then in September, SRHR related trans rights. And then um, in November, gay and bisexual men and SRHR. Um, so again, thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's been such a pleasure to host this and it's made me really think about how I can do so much better in terms of, of supporting um, the intersex movement and the intersex activists that I know in my life. Um, and doing a better job of, of making space for intersex representation. Um, so thank you very, very much and have a good day wherever you are in the world. Um, good evening from Melbourne. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Goodbye. Bye.